محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته so we have been talking about how to bring history to life in your classroom, whether you are teaching history or even if you are teaching the Qur'an and it's talking about history, how do you bring that to life? And I've shared with you some points. The first week I told you, let us go back to that moment in history and experience what the people then were experiencing. Secondly, we also say, let us narrate the authentic narrations of history because they have universal messages. Last week we also say that let us talk about divine principles. And if you remember, these are called as Sunnah and Ilahiyya, God's Sunnah, right? Because just as the Prophet has a Sunnah, a way of doing things, even God has a way of doing things. And whatever happened in history is also going to happen in this day and age. It's also going to happen in the future as well when the circumstances are the same. <coughs> And perhaps as we're talking about how to bring history to life, some of you are wondering, these are so many points. How can I bring all of these points into my classroom? And do I have to bring all of these points in all of my history classes? And the answer is no. These are tips and techniques. Sometimes you may have a history class where you can bring about divine principles. And that class lends itself to divine principles. Sometimes you may have a class where you can bring about divine values and talk about akhlaq. And sometimes you may have a history lesson where you can talk about life messages and life lessons in a philosophy of how to live life. I just want to talk about what this means for a few minutes. Life messages are a little different from values. When we talk about values, we're talking about being trustworthy, being honest, being generous, being forgiving, being affectionate, being brotherly, for example. But when we're talking about life messages, we're talking about what's a good way to live your life? What's a good approach for life? How does a Muslim approach his life? For example, one of the ways to approach life is to build on small successes. We normally try to go big and large, even with our programs, we want to go big and large, and sometimes we have to. But in reality, all the people who have been successful, they have built on small successes. Sometimes we're worried about the outcome. And if the outcome does not seem achievable, then we don't do our responsibility. No, a Muslim focuses on his responsibility more than he focuses on the outcome. Because he knows that the responsibility is in his hands, the outcome is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's really uh, important. <clears throat> Sometimes we try to change the conditions. And we can't change the conditions, we get quite upset. We get anxious or we get sad. And Islam teaches us that when you can't change the conditions, you can change what? You can change the way you think about the conditions. You perceive the conditions, all right? One more thing I want to share with you, and I'll give you an example from history, is sometimes we work on short-term goals, and we work on short-term achievements. The Muslim looks at long-term goals. How, what sort of effect is this approach going to have in the long term? For example, on Thursday night, when I was sharing with you parenting styles, we say that when you're parenting, don't just look at the short-term effects of your parenting, look at the long-term effect of it as well. Now when you look back in history, our Imams and the Prophet of Allah were like that, in their leadership styles. Okay? Now this is a life message that you can take from history, and then in your class you can talk about, now how can you apply that into your life? Because you will find that with a lot of the children, especially those who are between the ages of 13 and 18, they are impulse-driven. And when they are impulse-driven, they look at short-term consequences, and they don't think of long-term consequences. For example, doing drugs, doing alcohol, or even when it comes to picking friends. He is cool. He will get my status up there in the school if I'm hanging around him. 
No, but think what are the long-term consequences of hanging out with this particular person, right? Long-term consequences. So I'll give you a couple of examples now from the life of the Prophet and one from the life of our first Imam. And you've heard of these examples, but let's think about it along these lines now. Where, <coughs> you know, when the Prophet's son passed away, and on the same day there was what? There was a sun eclipse. Ah, and people came to the Holy Prophet and said, this is a miracle in Medina. This is a miracle. You are the Prophet of Allah. That when your son passes away, even the son is crying for your son. And the Prophet of Allah could have taken advantage of it. Short term consequences, right? And said, see, this is a miracle. I'm a Prophet of God. But what would have happened then? People would have become more and more superstitious. And they would have believed that actually celestial bodies, they, you know, change their orbits based on what's happening for a human being on this earth, right? And then would Muslims have had nine years of scientific exploration? Nine years of technology, nine, nine, nine years, right? Nine centuries of scientific exploration? They would not have had that. The Prophet is looking at long-term consequences. The first Imam, an example from his life. And when you bring that out in history, then look at the life messages we get from him. You know when he was uh, the Khalifa and he was giving lectures in the masjid, you know that the Khawarij used to come and disturb him. Even when he was leading Salat and he's reciting Quran, the Khawarij used to come and recite the Quran loudly on top of his Quran. And sometimes he would stop in the middle of the Salat until they were done and then he would continue. Okay? But even though he did that, even though they did that, and his companions came to him, and they say to him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, why don't you end them? Kick them out of the masjid. Kick them out of your land. And the Imam said, no. And he turned to the Khawarij, and he said to them, you have the right to your opinion. And as long as you're sharing your opinion, and you're not hurting anybody else, we will continue to allow you to come in the masjid. We will continue to pay you from Baytul Mal, and your monthly stipend will come to you. These other rights, you will continue to have them. Even though they were um, ch ch turning public opinion against our first Imam. Why did he do that? Because he wasn't just looking at short term consequences, he was looking at long term consequences. His actions are going to affect how me and you interact in our societies after 1,000 years. All right? And that's why he did that. So, when we're teaching history, let's bring out some life lessons that they can use in making their decisions in life, insha'Allah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.